certain places can give you a feeling of heightened reality. They can enhance your experience of the present moment, and that sensation can be called a sense of place. Sense of place has always existed in nature, but we as humans have always had the desire for our buildings to be more than just shelter. And one of the things that is special about architecture is that it too can create a sense of place. The ability to experience a sense of place is available to everyone, but if you're interested in designing such a space, let's say you're an architecture student, then in addition to conceptual and spatial ideas, an understanding of how a structure behaves is also needed and math calculations may be required. Now, I think I can safely speak for lots of people, and I include myself in this group, when I say that the math can be daunting, but it's possible to gain a qualitative understanding of how a structure behaves without the math. We'll look at one of the basic architectural elements, domes, which have their own particular sense of place, and we'll aim to understand conceptually how a dome behaves. Domes evolved as one of a cast of characters which include the basic elements in architecture. There's the simple post and beam system, the arch, the barrel vault, the groin vault, and the dome. And of course, there are lots of variations on all of these elements. The one that's a close cousin of the dome is the arch. An arch is a curved structure that spans a space. It's two-dimensional in nature, and it can support weight above it. The ancient Romans were the first to apply the technique of technique of arches to a really wide range of structures. A semicircular arch depends on having the angle of every joint meet at a point which is the center of the circle. Using temporary timber framework called centering, the pieces of the arch can be laid up and held in place until a keystone can be placed. The weight from above the arch travels down with gravity and some of the forces head straight down, other forces head sideways. So we humans are a pretty resourceful lot. We take an idea, we keep going with it, and over time in architecture, new building forms are developed. The dome is no exception to this because at some point, somebody realized that if they took an arch and spun it in a full circle around its central vertical axis, they would have a self-supporting column-free space. A dome has arch-like behavior, but very unlike an arch, no keystone is needed. The combination of forces is such that a hole in the top is no problem. This would be unthinkable in a two-dimensional arch where if you took the keystone out, the arch would collapse. There's a really famous example of just such a dome and it's the Pantheon in Rome. And it's very famous for its hole at the top called an oculus. And when rays of sun come in and light up particles of dust in the air, this interior takes on an otherworldly feel, and it really amplifies the sense of place under that dome. But how can we understand in a visual way how the forces work to keep a dome from collapsing? Well, imagine this experiment, and you could carry this out yourself with a few friends. A group of people stands in a circle. Everybody puts their arms over the shoulders of the person next to them, and then they all shimmy their feet backwards until their weight is no longer over their feet. Everybody will be leaning in on each other, keeping the whole circle standing. If anybody breaks their hold, the whole circle collapses. This circle of people represents the kinds of forces that are acting in a dome with a hole in the top. There's nothing at the top in this circle of people. Nobody's leaning directly against the person opposite them. Each person is supported in some way by the person to either side of them. And if you tried this, you'd feel that compression between your shoulders, and you would know intuitively that it's happening to the people on either side of you too. It's this ring of compressive forces that's preventing the circle of people from falling. Similar forces act to prevent a dome from collapsing. So this is not a complete description of domes because the human model relies on the fact that nobody's feet slip out backwards. This experiment would have a totally different outcome if everybody in the circle was standing in an ice rink wearing skates. Without friction forces from the ground, everybody's skates would slide backwards, and you can imagine what would happen from there. But a collapse could be prevented by tying everyone's feet together with a piece of rope. The rope would resist the tendency of the feet to slide outwards, and the rope would be in tension. It would be a tension ring at the bottom. This is exactly the solution that they use in the construction of domes. A metal chain is laid around the base of a dome under construction, where the tension forces are at their greatest, and then that chain is embedded 
in the finished construction. They just leave it there and build around it. In the people circle, each person is like a partial arch or a rib, whereas the surface of a dome is continuous. Domes have complex stresses because of their double curvature and they're under a constant and distributed gravity load over their entire surface. And by the way, domes can't handle a concentrated or a point load, only a distributed self-load. A masonry dome will produce thrusts that go down and outward. And you can think of these uh, forces at being, as being at right angles to each other. They are the internal forces within the material that the dome is made from. The first are meridional forces. Think of the meridians or the vertical lines of longitude on a globe. These are compressive only, and they increase as they move down towards the base. The others are hoop forces. Think of now, think of horizontal lines of latitude on a globe. These are in compression at the top and tension at the base. The switch from compression to tension happens at an angle of 51 degrees, measuring from the top down. Um, and traditional masonry analysis refers to loons or crescent shaped sections. If you imagine that you've peeled a half of an orange, you set it on a plate, these segment divisions of the orange represent the vertical meridian lines. Now let's say you press down on the top of the orange, you'd start to see splits appear at the lines where the segments meet. And the segments behavior represent the tendency for the lower meridional strips to deform outwards. The hoop forces that contain this are in tension, like the rope around everyone's ankles. That's what puts the tension into a tension ring. Near the top of the uh, dome or the orange, these same meridional forces want to deform inwardly. So the hoop stresses at the top are in compression. Remember that circle of people feeling compression in their shoulders, which held the top of the people circle from falling. So from the top center of the dome down to the haunch at an angle of 51 degrees, the stress is completely compressive. And below the haunch, the tensile forces grow stronger. The forces at the bottom of a masonry dome are typically handled either by that chain we talked about or a massive abutment or both. Since the magnitude of tensile hoop stresses is dependent on the self weight of a dome, it's a great idea to decrease the weight of the dome wherever you can. Roman engineers recognized this and they had a couple of tricks. They realized that larger, more stable domes would be possible if they could vary the weight of the concrete in direct response to the stress patterns that they observed. And they did this just by changing the thickness of the dome wall. For instance, in the Pantheon, it's 19 feet thick at the bottom and it diminishes to five feet in thickness at the top. They also varied the concrete mix from the bottom to the top. In the Pantheon, the aggregate in the concrete changes three times from broken bricks in the mix at the base of the dome to light volcanic rock in the mix at the top. The Romans also using formwork built a pattern of recesses or coffers into the inside surface of their domes. And by removing a certain amount of concrete from each coffer, the overall weight of the dome was substantially lighter. The coffer pattern also had the beneficial side effect of creating ribs and these help to stiffen the dome while the concrete is curing or hardening. Even with all of these measures, cracks can develop at the top of large domes, but it doesn't necessarily make them unsafe. In fact, many large domes that you are familiar with have cracks at their bases and they still have them for a very long time. So domes can be found in unexpected materials and in seemingly untechnologically advanced places, but the dome, even though it was not a Roman invention, the Romans were the first to overcome the challenges associated with it and to perfect the form as we enjoy it and as we continue to reinterpret it today.